Miners dug deeper into the rock, they met a new danger. Now, if choke damp was present and the miner tried to disperse it, he would often waft an explosive mixture of fire damp and air onto his candle. Another dangerous sort of bad air, but of a fiery nature like lightning, which blasts and tears all before it if it take hold of the candle. Men and workings were destroyed by one explosion after another. The only solution was to fire the gas deliberately. Several times a day, firemen, as they were most aptly called, would enter the mine and each in his own way would prepare to fire the pockets of gas. Here, one would hide himself in a shallow hole beneath some timber. Another, often called the penitent, from the monk-like nature of his protective rags, would approach the area of danger with a candle on a pole. Then, in one way or another, the gas would be ignited. So the mine was made safe for a few hours. But the problem of water was more serious at this time. Adits could not be used where the belt of coal lay deep under the surface. Something was needed to lift the water out of the mine. Many ingenious machines to do this were produced in the 17th century. One method was to adapt a horse gin to turn a chain of buckets, as used in the Middle East today for irrigation. More complex inventions followed. For this was a golden century of art and science, the century of Milton, Wren, Newton and the Royal Society. The machines of this age were the prologue to the Industrial Revolution. But they were made of wood and wore out too quickly. Their only power was by water, wind or horse, and this was not enough as the mines became still deeper. Coal owners spent more and more money on drainage and the price of coal rose alarmingly. The constant steady seepage of water threatened mine after mine with closure. One gloomy prophet in the House of Commons complained that the pits would be flooded before the 20 years lease of the mines expired. But he had not reckoned with the genius of the engineers. As the century closed, man harnessed nature in the shape of steam. 1698. A patent was granted to Captain Savory for a new invention, driven by the impellent force of fire, which will be of great use for draining of mines. Savory was not to succeed, but Thomas Newcomen, some 15 years later, produced a practical engine. At Griff Colliery, the first mechanically propelled machine was installed for pumping water. It replaced 50 horses and saved 750 pounds a year. These engines had to be made by craftsmen in the traditional materials, wood, copper and lead. Iron was still too scarce to be used. Over a hundred of these machines had been installed in the north of England alone by the middle of the 18th century. Then a new partnership arose. Abraham Darby perfected the coking of coal and used it in the smelting of iron. From 1740 onwards, iron was produced cheaply and plentifully by the use of coal, and in its turn, iron helped to produce more coal. With cheap iron, the steam engine was rapidly improved, although its only function was to pump water and to drain the mines. And with cheap iron, Haulage in the coal fields was transformed. 
Until now, almost the only improvement underground had been a wheelbarrow on planks. This had been used for centuries. Wooden wheels on wooden rails were another idea of the 17th century. Now came iron, and railways improved. Above ground, the rail system in the collieries advanced even more rapidly, and level haulages often ran for several miles. Where the ground sloped, the empty wagons would be pulled up to the pit bank by the full ones which ran down under their own weight on a self-acting inclined plane. Sometimes a horse would pull up the empties. To save the horse unnecessary walking, a special wagon was provided to take him on the downward journey. A privilege, we are told, that the horse highly appreciated. <laughs> 